uh, thank you for that great introduction, Jim. It's great to be back here at the Heartland Institute. As he said, I, I am a former staffer. I ran Heartland's development program from uh, 2003 through the middle of 2007. Um, and so the opportunity to come back and speak at what is sort of my public policy alma mater, because needless to say, I did not get much of a free market education at Drake, um, is, is very exciting and rewarding for me. Um, today I want to talk about a couple of things. I'm probably going to hit lightly on a, a number of topics and uh, hopefully stimulate some, some good questions for later uh, that, that we can dive into with a little bit more depth. Um, but what I want to hit on while I'm right here is uh, one, why I wrote the book, uh, two, what it means to be a self-paid patient, uh, and as part of that, why somebody might want to become a self-paid patient, and third, uh, what it means for the free market healthcare movement, uh, what my book uh, means for the movement and how it might be able to tie in with the efforts to get uh, a free market in healthcare. Um, but before I do that, I, I want to sort of acknowledge the role that Heartland had in helping me to write this book. Uh, as I said, I used to be a staffer here, uh, charged mainly with fundraising. One day I went to Joe Bast and I said, Joe, I, I think I'd, I'd really appreciate the opportunity to write for some of the newspapers. And Joe was kind enough to uh, allow that, even though that wasn't my job here. Um, and so I started writing for the newspapers, and I had a particular affinity for healthcare issues, and so I wrote most of my articles for that. And at a certain point, I frankly got kind of annoyed, because everything that I was writing was about, oh, we need Congress to do this. If only the state legislatures would allow that. These regulators are being problematic. Everything I was writing about free market health care was about going to the government and asking them, can we please do this? Can things be a little different? And, you know, as a free market libertarian, I find that highly annoying and offensive. So I decided that what I was going to do is write a couple of articles, at least, on people who weren't waiting for the government, who weren't waiting for a regulator to say, yes, you can do things that way. I was actually going to write about providers and patients who said, you know, don't worry about this government. I've got this. I'll, t I'll take care of this on my own without waiting for you. So I wrote a number of articles uh, on that theme. I specifically wrote articles about healthcare sharing ministries, uh, insurance, free pharmacies, and retail health clinics. After that, uh, I wound up getting dragged into other things and, and eventually left Heartland. But those articles that I wrote here at Heartland really planted the seed for me about the general idea of people simply opting out of the third party payment system and just going out on their own and paying for health care directly. So the seed was planted here at Heartland and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, this is all basically a long-winded way of saying that when I'm hauled before a judge or a congressional committee and have to justify my crimes against the people in the area of health care, I plan on blaming Joe Bass. <laughs> so you can expect the subpoena too. Um, so you know, I left Heartland, I worked, uh, I ran the Center for Competitive Politics, we did First Amendment campaign finance work, I didn't really spend much time uh, in healthcare. I wound up uh, leaving there, setting up my own consulting firm, doing some healthcare policy work, and about 18 months ago I once again found myself very, very annoyed. Because for largely the same reasons as uh, I was before. It was all about, oh, if only the government would let us do this. We need new policies, we need new programs, we need different programs. And I was also hearing at the same time people talking about opting out of Obamacare. I'm going to opt out of Obamacare, or you should opt out of Obamacare. And I'm you know, very sympathetic to that argument, but what I wasn't hearing as part of that argument, people encouraging others or saying they're going to opt out of Obamacare, was then what? I mean, okay, so you opt out of Obamacare, you're not going to... Uh, by insurance. Well, what happens when you do need health care? I mean, my college roommate, age 21, was diagnosed with testicular cancer. People need health care quite frequently. Uh, you can't always predict it. And if you're going to opt out, well, how do you do that? How do you get access to your, your health care? I mean, I knew personally how I could do it because of the stuff that I had written here at Heartland. 
but I didn't see anybody else out there talking about this. There were a number of books that had titles that had the word Obamacare, survival, beating, escaping, whatever. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and check out a couple of these books and see if they are actually providing the type of information that I knew, but that I wasn't seeing out there in public. The books were all basically useless, at least in this regard. Uh, they were very, some very well written, some very badly written screeds about how terrible Obamacare is. Again, I'm sympathetic to that argument, but it did not provide any, you know, helpful information to somebody who does want to opt out, who does want an alternative to the third party payer system. So after sort of surveying the field, I decided, you know what, if nobody else has written that book, maybe that's what I'm going to do. Maybe I'm going to be the one who writes the book that explains how to opt out of Obamacare. So I did. Um, and uh, it's, it's been a very rewarding experience. I've been come into contact with uh, a number of people across the country who have come to the same conclusion that I think a lot of you in this room have come to, which is that you don't want the government involved in your health care. You don't want a health insurance bureaucrat getting between you and your doctor, and they're looking for an alternative, or in some cases they're providing an alternative. So that was how I came to, to write the, the book, and frankly, Annoyance. <laughs> And uh, uh, so that uh, the book was published in uh, December and January of 2013-2014, and I've been uh, talking uh, to groups and on, to media and to other people about it ever since. So the, the first question I invariably get when I go somewhere is they ask, ask okay, what is a self-pay patient? Uh, and, and I explain to them that a self-pay patient is simply anybody who is paying directly for their own health care without a third party intermediary. Now obviously that's the uninsured. There's 40 million plus uninsured in America right now, give or take, even after the universal health care program of Obamacare came out. Um, and uh, obviously these people are self-pay. When they need health care, they have to pay for it. Uh, in addition to those people, however, you have tens of millions of Americans who are in high deductible health plans, maybe with an HSA, maybe not. These are people that, again, they are paying directly for their health care. And the other group that is self-pay is basically everybody else, potentially, because even if you have your typical comprehensive health insurance with your $20 copay and your $500 deductible that I think only government workers have these days, but they are still out there. Uh, even those people wind up being self-pay from time to time because the provider that they want to go see is out of network. Or their insurer is telling them, I'm sorry, we don't cover that procedure, or you have to try this treatment first and fail that treatment before we can actually get to the treatment that your doctor thinks is, is appropriate for you. And a lot of people are just not willing to put up with that. And so they wind up going out and paying directly for their own health care. Uh, so why would anybody become a self-pay patient. I think a lot of you can already sort of sense the, the drift of, of why that might be an attractive option for people, but uh, there's really three reasons that I want to touch on briefly. The first is simply that there are a lot of people out there, myself included, who really don't want the government involved in their health care. They don't want their medical records in some database maintained by HHS. They don't want the government deciding uh, you know, which insurance policies they have to buy, what it has to cover, what price it has to be sold out. Uh, they just don't want government involved in their health care. I think everybody in this room is probably uh, sympathetic to that. Uh, the second reason why people might want to become a self-pay patient is simply to eliminate the bureaucratic hassle and the third-party interference that I just mentioned, where it's, there's a third party in that examining room it's not just you and your doctor. There is that insurance bureaucrat saying this is the appropriate treatment. Whereas that, there's that government bureaucrat saying, no, we don't allow you to do this this way if you're doing it on the government dime. So uh, simply eliminating the, the bureaucratic hassles, uh, which can be substantial. My wife has uh, suffers from very serious migraines. And over the last two years, I've watched her devote probably close to 200 hours, that's five work weeks, simply dealing with her health insurer to try and get them to cover the treatment that everybody who's ever looked at her medical file and has an MD after their name says, yes, this is the appropriate treatment for someone with migraines this severe. I would say at this point that she probably has, if you were to take the explanation of benefits, 
the denials of treatment, the appeals of the denials of treatment, the responses to the denials of the appeal of treatment, the, uh, the requests for more information, all of the bureaucratic paperwork that goes along with this. She probably has about a one foot stack of paperwork just to get the treatment that her doctors say, well, yeah, of course, this is what she needs. So eliminating, if, you, if you're looking for a way to eliminate that, becoming a self-pay patient is the way to go because it's you, your doctor, and yeah, your checkbook. The third way, and uh, or the third reason why people might want to consider becoming a self-pay patient is pretty, pretty basic. It's a terrific way to save money. It is a lot less expensive in many cases to opt out of the third-party payment system and just pay directly for your health care. Uh, and, and that really is the heart of the book that I wrote. Obviously, I, I'm, I'm free market. Obviously, I'm not a fan of the bureaucratic interference in health care. But I wanted to write a book that would appeal to an audience other than just libertarians. I wanted to write a book that would appeal to somebody who maybe thinks Obamacare or even single payer is the right way to go. It's just not working out for them right now, and so they need to go and, uh, you know, have a, uh, find a, a doctor that accepts cash because that's the situation that they find themselves in. So that's the, the, the book that I wrote and the, uh, the, the savings that, that people can get being a self-pay patient are pretty substantial. Um, for example, imagine a 43-year-old male, that's me actually, uh, living in the Chicago area who maybe has been told by his doctor that there might be an issue and he needs a, a colonoscopy. Now, one of the many perversities of Obamacare is that if you don't have any symptoms, then your colonoscopy is free. Milton Friedman had something to say about what is and isn't free, of course, but according to the law, it's free. Uh, but if you actually have symptoms that has your doctor saying, oh, maybe we need to do a colonoscopy, that's not a free preventive service. So you're going to have to pay for that, assuming it's under your deductible and you don't have one of these super rich government plans. Uh, so imagine that that 43-year-old here in Chicago, they have the, uh, the, the silver reference plan for Cook County. It's Blue Cross Blue Shield policy. It's what uh, all of the subsidies in Cook County are tied into. Uh, and it has a $5,000 deductible. So this person is going to be thinking to themselves, probably, okay, I'm going to have to pay for this out of my pocket. And so they start calling around. Well, if they call up at the various hospitals and, and, uh, and doctor's offices that perform this procedure, they're probably going to be told after they explain that they're a Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, policyholder, oh, it's maybe about $1,800. That's uh, what the average uh, insurer pays in, in the Chicago area. $1,800, that's a fair chunk of change uh, that they have to pay for because their insurance isn't going to cover it at all. If they're uninsured, they're going to be told, ah, $3,000. $3,500, because in one of the other perversities of our non-market healthcare system, we actually usually charge the uninsured more than we charge Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, so this person is going to have a, a couple of different options. Uh, depending on whether they're insured or uninsured, they can just say, okay, I'll, I'll pay for that. that you know, I'm, my doctor says I need it, it's going to suck, but I'll pay for it. Or they can decide, I can't afford that. And if they aren't familiar with the tools and the options that are available to self-pay patients, you know, that's it. They're either going to overpay for it or they're just not going to get it. The reason I'm specifically talking about a Chicago man getting a colonoscopy is because there actually was such a man, maybe about a year ago, who did know about one of the tools available to self-pay patients. He was actually uninsured. He was the one calling around getting those $3,000, $3,500 prices. He went on a website called Metabid. Now, Metabid is an online bidding site where patients simply load up what the treatment is that they're looking for. In his case, he said, I need a colonoscopy. And doctors from around the country compete by submitting bids to provide that treatment. In his particular case, he wound up getting a bid from a doctor in Oregon for $800. It was, he, he saved $2,000 at least simply by getting on a plane, flying to Oregon, staying in a hotel, and then going to see this doctor in Oregon who would do it for $800. That's one of the tools that are available to self-pay patients. There's another website called mdsave.com. 
MDSave.com is basically doctors. They don't bid, they simply have price lists that they essentially load their price lists up and people can search and, and see what they can, uh, you know, the providers, which providers are available to provide the service they need. Uh, I was on there the other day, uh, a colonoscopy would be $1,200, less than the $1,800 that he would pay as a Blue Cross Blue Shield patient, certainly less than the $3,000 to $3,500 that he would pay as an uninsured person here in Chicago. Uh, there's another one, clearhealthcosts.com, and this is a site where you can go, and they essentially are maybe kind of a, a deals type of website. Not quite like Groupon, but maybe similar to that in some regards. $500. I found a doctor offering colonoscopies. They're in New York, so your Chicago man would have to fly to New York. Uh, $500 to do that. And this is just touching the, the surface of the entire self-pay healthcare market. Uh, other tools and options. There are doctors out there, there are thousands of doctors out there that have opted out of third-party payment entirely. And they simply, they post their prices, or they say if it's a 15-minute visit, that's $40. If it's a 30-minute visit, that's $75. Whatever their fees are, they're posted, they're transparent. If you show up with your Blue Cross Blue Shield card, they're going to say, please put that away. I don't do that. Get out your visa. Get out your checkbook. Uh, there are surgical centers and hospitals out there that have developed package pricing. One of the things that self-pay patients run into quite frequently when they try and get a surgical procedure or other magical uh, medical treatment at a hospital, they run into something called the charge master. The charge master is quite possibly the most pernicious and fictitious thing in the healthcare world. Uh, they are essentially random numbers, as near as I can tell, generated by hospitals so that they can justify uh, to Blue Cross Blue Shield. Well, you know, we're charging three. Th we're charging you three thousand dollars for this treatment, uh, and that's eighty percent off of our Charge Master. So you're getting a terrific deal because our, our real price is five times that or four times that. Uh, so it's essentially fictitious numbers that they then knock. 60, 70, 80 percent off in a manner that makes used car dealers look pretty straightforward in terms of their pricing practices. And it, it basically, nobody winds up paying these prices except the uninsured, except the true self-pay patient. But there are hospitals out there that have said, forget this, we're just going to do a straight package pricing. It's not going to have 100 line items with the $70 aspirin and the $400 saline and the inflated charge master price. Need a hernia surgery? Okay, that's $3,500. That's your surgeon, that's your anesthesiologist, that's the facility fee, that's the medications, that's everything. $3,500 or whatever the, the price is that they've settled on. And usually their prices are anywhere from half to a quarter of what somebody would get if they simply went down to the, the public hospital, uh, private, government run, nonprofit, doesn't matter. They all do the charge master game and these hospitals that are offering these package prices anywhere from 25% to 50% of what they're charging at the, the local hospitals. There's medical tourism. People literally, a uh, uh, lady that I know, uh, she was told that a surgical procedure she needed here in the U.S. that her insurer would not cover, $35,000. She flew to India and got it for $7,000. Uh, uh, there are a whole bunch of different options. Telemedicine, where you can get on the phone with the doctor, maybe $25, $30, uh, and tell them, you know, I accidentally wound up in some poison ivy. Doctor can write you a prescription over the phone, send it to your nearby pharmacy, you go, you get it, it's instant, and the pricing is straightforward, and you don't have to wait a day, two days, a week to get in to see your primary care physician. These options cover pretty much anything and everything that you might want in the self-pay market. Now, I want to explain real briefly why it is that uh, it is less expensive quite often to go the self-pay route and simply pay directly for your health care. There's a myth out there that I think everybody's probably heard at one point or another that says that insurers get great deals from providers from hospitals uh, because they buy in bulk. And, and they're, they're able to use their negotiating power to get great prices for the primary care physicians and the specialists and so forth. This is a complete myth. I won't go into it uh, other than to say that in May I wrote a piece up on the Federalist.com blog explaining why it is that health insurers don't actually buy in bulk and why those savings are essentially uh, fictitious. But 
the one thing that I will explain to you is that the uh, uh, doctors who have gone cash only, these hospitals and surgical centers that just offer flat pricing, the reason that they're able to be less expensive than their competitors who accept insurance, uh, one, obviously, because they aren't tied into these ridiculous charge master prices, but two is simply that because they don't have the bureaucratic overhead that comes with it. The amount of money that Blue Cross Blue Shield and my wife's neurologist have invested in bouncing that one foot stack of paperwork back and forth, the staff time that is involved in the doctor's office writing the appeal, responding to the, re the request for more information, all of that, that's very expensive. It's fairly typical for a four person medical practice, four doctor medical practice, might have three or four people whose sole job is to code the bills, to communicate with the insurers, to follow up, to correct the errors when the insurance company says you coded this wrong. That is very expensive. It is typically uh, the, the doctors that have opted out of third party payment systems, usually they're finding that they're able to cut 20, 25, 30, 35, 40% off of their, the entire cost of their medical office because it is so expensive to maintain that infrastructure. So as a result of these doctors who have opted out and decided that they're not going to participate in the third party payment system, I can tell you about a primary care doctor in Texas who for pretty much anything within the scope of a primary care practice, you can walk in and for $40 they'll treat you. That's less than some co-pays that people have to go see a doctor if they have an Aetna or a Blue Cross Blue Shield policy. Uh, there's a dermatologist in Coos Bay, Oregon. Uh, if you have cancer skin lesions you want removed, you can walk into her office and in an hour she'll take them off, assuming they aren't covering your whole body or anything. Uh, $400 to remove cancer skin lesions. If you try and go to any of the other dermatologists in the area who accept insurance, their cash price, $835. Uh, and Surgery Center of Oklahoma, which I talked about a little earlier, uh, a hernia repair operation, depending on the type that you need, between $3,200 and $4,500. You can easily pay $20,000 as a self-paid patient if you made the mistake of walking into your typical public hospital that does not uh, uh, gear itself towards self-paid patients. Um, so. There's one other thing I want to touch on before I get to the wrapping up with the, the free market. And you know, what I've talked to you about today is how you can go shopping for health care. But there's another element to being a self pay patient that I think is very important. And, and this is one of the things that frankly bothered me the most about a lot of the people that were out there telling people that they should opt out of Obamacare. What happens when somebody does have a major medical need? I mean, most of us are not in a position where if we have a heart attack, you know, we. $35,000, by the way, if anybody's wondering what it'll cost you, assuming you can get a fair price uh, at a hospital, around $35,000 is what it's going to cost you to, to deal with a heart attack. Uh, not a lot of people have that kind of money sit, sitting around. Well, it turns out that there are actually alternatives to conventional health insurance. You don't have to go buy your Obamacare approved insurance policy or whatever it is that your employer has provided. There are Mechanisms out there. Mechanisms out there. There are specific types of insurance out there that you can obtain that will provide you the funding that you need for when you do have that heart attack or you do get diagnosed with cancer. My personal favorite, and it's the one that I've actually taken advantage of, is what's called a healthcare sharing ministry. What a sharing ministry is is essentially a nonprofit, voluntary association of people who have come together and said, "We will share one another's medical bills." And if you're a member of this ministry, then if you, you know, break your arm, and that's a $10,000 uh, medical bill, or you get a heart attack, you submit your bills to the ministry, and the other members either send you directly checks to pay off the bill, or they, the member, other members send their checks to the ministry, and the ministry then bundles that and, and sends it to you. Uh, it effectively operates the same way insurance does in a lot of regards. It's completely unregulated. Uh, that terrifies a lot of people who are used to the warm embrace of the state looking after their best interests. Uh, I, I happen to love it myself. The less regulation, the better. Um, they are completely unregulated. They do not have to cover all of the things that Obamacare requires insurance companies to cover. They are less expensive by far than conventional health insurance. In my particular case, uh, I saved 75% 
by joining the healthcare sharing ministry instead of going on my wife's policy at work. Same 75% I saved by not uh, buying an insurance policy through the Obamacare exchanges. They are radically, radically less expensive. Um, and the, the nicest thing, one of the nice features about the healthcare sharing ministries is that they are specifically written into Obamacare as if you are a member of a sharing ministry, even though you're technically uninsured, you do not have to pay the tax that Obamacare levies on people who are uninsured. And furthermore, and this seems particularly important these days, unfortunately, it is written in such a way that there's no executive order that can overrule this. There's no regulation. I mean, unless they truly are willing to say, we're tyrant, we're completely ignoring everything. Um, it, it is written in such a way that they cannot get around it. They cannot do anything to shut this down if more and more people go to it. It is incredibly explicit, it is incredibly direct, and most importantly, and this is where the Obama administration has been very clever in most of their illegal activity, most of their illegal activity has involved things where nobody has standing to sue. There's nobody who can present an injury that a lawsuit would correct. If they were to try and do something in the area of the healthcare sharing ministries, I personally would have an injury. I would have standing to sue them and I would win hands down. Um, so that's one of the nice features about the healthcare sharing ministries. These are Christian organizations. Four of the five that are out there do require that you be a Christian to be a member. There is a fifth one, however, that does not require that. You can be atheist, you can be Muslim, you can be whatever you want, uh, and you can be a member of it. So it's, it's uh, they're, while they're rooted in the Christian faith, there's at least one option for people that are not Christians. Uh, there are other options as well. There are healthcare, or, I'm sorry, there are... Uh, uh, insurance policies, critical illness policies, accident policies uh, that will provide you cash that you can use to go pay for your health care. So I can buy a, an insurance policy that will pay me $50,000 if I have a heart attack. Okay, I now have the cash to pay for my heart attack if, if that's what happens to me. Um, there are some other options. They're all in the book, uh, which if you haven't bought, you should. Um, and uh, uh, so, so those are some of the options that as self-pay patients you can be thinking about and, and sort of looking at whether or not they might be the right option for you. The last thing, I'm going to wrap it up here really quickly. Uh, the last thing is, uh, how does this impact the free market, uh, the movement for free market health care? I've been in and around the free market health care movement for probably close to a decade. And, you know, I, I have a tremendous admiration for everybody that is in it. That said, I've watched for a decade where almost everything that has been done and said in this area from the people who share my perspectives on free market healthcare is, you know, going back to what I was writing about in healthcare news a decade ago, please government let us do the, this thing. If we can get health savings accounts expanded, if we can get interstate sale of health insurance, if we can get tort reform, if we can get these things, uh, mandate-free policies sold in the states, if we can, if the government will let us do these things, then we can have a free market in health care. And those are all fine things. I mean, I support all of them. But what has been overlooked is that we do have a free market in health care in America today. It is not the dominant system. I know that the, the left, they look at our health care system and they see insurance companies making profits and they say, aha, that's the free market because you have profits. I think everybody here understands just how dumb of an analysis that is, but that's their perspective. When I say we have a free market in healthcare, I say it in the same way that I might say that we have a free market in education. Not the dominant system, but a parallel system in education composed of uh, homeschoolers and private schools. In the healthcare market, the free market is not the dominant system that is run by the state. It is the self-pay market. The self-pay healthcare market is willing buyers, willing sellers, agreeing on a price, no middleman, hardly any regulation. If that's not the free market, I don't know what is. So my encouragement to you would be, if you want a free market in healthcare, if you want to be a part of a free market in healthcare, do not wait for Congress to pass the appropriate legislation. Don't wait for the occupant of the White House to change. Don't wait for your state legislatures to make that right tweak so that the HSAs work just a little bit better. 
you can join the free market in healthcare today. No waiting, no permission required. You can just do it. Uh, that's all I have for uh, my stump speech. Be happy to answer any questions. I know I touched on a lot of different subjects, and uh, start right here. Well, it's one thing to talk about the price of services, but how do we monitor the quality of the professional? Right. Because, you know, I want to keep my doctor. Sure, sure. Um, quality in healthcare, my observation has been that when people talk about quality in healthcare, uh, from the insurance company perspective, low price is quality. I mean, that, that's when you read people talking about how to get the quality metrics in healthcare, nine times out of ten, it's somebody from Blue Cross Blue Shield or Medicare basically saying, you know, quality, oh yeah, that's, that's the lowest cost guy. So most of what you see in terms of quality in healthcare, uh, I, I don't give a lot of credence to. Um, the metrics for quality in healthcare, there, there are a handful of them where you can tell, but frankly, uh, they're very difficult. It's very difficult to know in advance whether your doctor is a good doctor or a bad doctor. And uh, probably the best that you're going to do uh, is just follow a couple of simple rules of thumb. Yelp and there's a couple of like healthgrades.com. There are a couple of services out there. And, and this is for both in, within the dominant third-party payer system and the cash-only system. But just customer reviews. I mean, patient reviews are probably one of the most effective and, and, from my perspective, legitimate ways of assessing quality. If you're talking about surgeons, uh, uh, volume. I mean, surgeons who have done this done a particular procedure more often and are board certified, you're probably better off going there than anywhere else. But as far as trying to assess the quality of a provider, there isn't really any way, with one caveat, uh, there isn't really any way to, you know, distinguish between, well, how do I tell, you know, in the self-pay world versus the, uh, the uh, third-party payer system. There's not really much of a difference there. The one caveat I will add is that the people who go to the cash-only doctors, uh, they tend to report, and the doctors are thrilled uh, to be able to say this publicly, they spend a lot more time with their patients. I mean, most people, you go in, you see your, your third-party payer doctor, you know, if, if you get three minutes with the nurse and five minutes with the doctor, you're probably right about average for what most people going through an HMO or even a PPO are gonna hit. More if you're going to see a specialist, but still, it's it's a treadmill that they're on. Uh, if you go see a, a, a cash-only or cash-friendly doctor, you're probably gonna get, you know, 15 minutes half an hour, depending. I mean, you get much, much more attention. And usually the doctors that are cash only, because they have so much less overhead, they need fewer patients. A, a typical doctor's office might need 4,000 patients per doctor to you know keep the doors open and pay the, the rent. A doctor that's cash only, uh, yeah, I have 1,000. I might have 1,500 patients. Um, and they just have fewer patients to deal with. They have more time to spend with their patients and to the extent that more time with patients equals better care, which I think is the case, uh, that's probably you know how you sort of look at that quality thing. Uh, right there and then I'll... Yes, um, how would I determine the tax I would have to pay if I were to get rid of my policy and how would I prove to the government that I'm part of this health ministry that would get me around having to pay that tax. Yeah, uh, that is something, of course, the IRS has yet to write the forms and the regulations and stuff like that. But uh, my understanding is that the uh, the ministries are going to send a, a certificate, basically, that says, you know, Sean Parnell is a member of XYZ ministry and, and was from this date until this date, uh, you know, stamped with something and, uh, and and I'll you know attach that to my tax uh, return that's basically how it's going to, to work out the IRS is still trying to you know they've got a lot of things on their plate um, but it, it should be fairly straightforward and nobody thinks that it's going to be terribly complex or, or difficult to, yes great presentation thank you, thank you. Um, I didn't have any health insurance till I was 50. I figure when I hit 50, I better start doing this thing. Things are going to start breaking on me. You know, it, it's part of the uh, 
inevitable, right? It's going to get yes. worse until we yep. reach a terminal state. Okay, so, so I got health insurance, and two weeks later, I got a kidney stone. You know? mm -hmm. Was that lucky or what? I mean, the fact is, I got a kidney stone. It's really bad. Yeah. But my question has to do with the self pay aspect of your, your presentation. It seems to me that if, if someone's going to go that route, and that's kind of more or less what I do because I have a $5,000 deductible, that um, it's incumbent upon the person who's going to do this to really inform themselves as best they can about what it is they might need or not need. So when they go in front of the doctor for three or five minutes, they've got questions that he has to answer. It may take longer to get good, you know, quality responses to that. And uh, how how uh, I do that, but I, I think a lot of people probably just say, "Well, the doctor told me this. That's all there's to it." Yeah, and one of the things about uh, being a self-pay patient is that they, they do tend to sort of understand, you know, this is this is my dollar. I want to get value for it. I mean, that, that's one of the biggest problems with our, the dominant system is there's no link between the dollars you pay and the value that you receive. If your copay to go see a, a, uh, a specialist is $20, then anything that's worth $20 to you, you know, even though the insurance company is paying $400 for that visit, uh, you know, the marginal utility, uh, you know, that, that's part of the problem. Self-pay patients tend to understand, okay, I need to figure out, is this going to be of value to me? You know, I have a sore knee, should I just ice it? Or is this, you know, worth going and spending $40 to see this primary care physician? Um, there are some, uh, you know, different terms are used, like decision-making tools or resource uh, websites out there that sort of have the aim uh, and it's not necessarily geared towards self-pay patients, but I think it's especially valuable to self-pay patients, where it will, you know, tell them, uh, okay, you have these symptoms, uh, you may, you know, have, you know, one of these three things. Here are some of the questions to ask your doctor, and here are some of the treatments that are commonly recommended, and here are the side effects of those. So those are out there. I think actually that WebMD uh, has some of these types of, of tools. Um, but yeah, being a, a informed consumer is very important for self-pay patients. But because they're paying directly, that's sort of already, for most people, uh, you know, comes with the territory. They understand that, you know, they, they, they want to know a bit about what they might be going in for. At the back there, and then I'll take you. Uh, talk about the perils of use of the HSA. I, I use the, uh, I've been a $10,000 deductible for a long time, I have my HSA. Can you give me any comments on the use of the HSA fund? Yeah, uh, HSAs, I'm a big fan of HSAs. They're a great concept. However, <laughs> the problem with HSAs, uh, and I think that this actually you know, explains why they haven't taken off the way some of us, frankly, hoped they would, is that the concept was, hey, you know, you're a self-pay patient. You have money set aside for your health care needs. You walk in, you write the check, you walk out. It's all good. No muss, no fuss. Unfortunately, because health savings accounts are so intrinsically tied with conventional health insurance, with networks, with the negotiated rates and the discounts and all of that bureaucratic paper shoving, uh, it still has the same costs you aren't saving the doctor any money when you walk in, unless they're a cash-only doctor, but if you just walk into a typical doctor's office with an HSA, you're not going to save them any money because they still have to route it through the insurance company that you have to know what price you're paying. Uh, they're still going to get feedback along the lines of, oh, you know, you should have got a pre-approval for that and that whole thing, and then two months later they'll finally spit out something to go back to you and say, okay, you paid your $25 copay, uh, and now we need the other $78 or whatever it is for the, the negotiated rate for the type of office visit you had. So the problem with HSAs is that they were created with the idea that you would have a fairly easy market for healthcare services, and by and large, again, except for the doctors and facilities that have opted out and gone third party free, that hasn't happened. Uh, using an HSA, at most doctors still entails the same level of overhead and bureaucratic expense. And until uh, insurers sort of break the habit and just say, you know what, if it's less than $5,000, just whatever the doctor charges is fine and we're going to credit it towards your deductible. Until the insurers are willing to take that step, that's going to be the case, I think, that HSAs are going to have some value, but they're going to be limited in their utility. So, Jim. 
Um, great presentation. Thank you so much for coming back and sharing your thoughts. Uh, my question is, I, I sense casual empiricism, admittedly, <laughs> that uh, my doctors are abandoning individual practices and joining group practices or forming group practices. Now, is this a progressive kind of move or is it a regressive? <laughs> Frankly, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, you know, one doctor getting together with three other doctors and saying, hey, let's open a practice together. That's, that's not a problem. The problem is, is that the phenomenon you're talking about right now is being driven by the Affordable Care Act, the accountable care organizations. The, 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 one of the things when I talk about health care policy in general, not self-pay patient stuff, uh, is health care reform on a lot of levels is a... Uh, the, the, the practice of trying to pit, you know, monopsonists here against monopolists there and oligopsonists, uh, you know, tr tr trying to leverage the negotiating power of favored entities against disfavored entities. That's how a lot of health care reform, including the Affordable Care Act, is structured. And what you're seeing with the uh, 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 individual doctors joining in to group practices or group practices being bought out by hospitals is you're seeing that, you know, favored entities being, you know, taking advantage of that favor to try and, you know, take over the disfavored entities, and that drives up costs. You know, if, if your uh, individual practitioner uh, joins a practice that is owned by a hospital, well, hospital-based care is more expensive. The hospital gets to charge more for that. Even though you're going to the, you know, outpatient clinic or the same doctor's office you've been going to, they get to charge the insurer more for that because now it's hospital-based care. And uh, I, I think that is a huge problem. I also think, however, a lot of doctors are recognizing that this is the game and they don't want to be a part of it. And that is what I think driving people to consider going cash only. I, I spoke uh, about two months ago at an event by the uh, Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. They're going around the country and explaining to doctors the benefits of setting up cash only practices. And one of the things that I heard over and over and over again from all of these doctors is, you know, I'm being pressured, my practice is being pressured to, you know, join another one so that we can negotiate better deals with the hospitals and with the, uh, with the insurance companies. And, uh, and a lot of them are going for it because they figure that's the only way. But a lot of them are saying, I don't want to be a part of that system. I want to be me, my patients. I don't want the local hospital taking a cut and driving up my prices. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it's double-edged sword. It's bad, but I think it's driving uh, more doctors to consider going cash on lane. Yes, back there. Uh, you convinced me, as soon as I said, I've talked about it a lot of already. Uh, we already have this kind of with uh, CVS pharmacies and that first place is you can go in and pay for right. something. I've done this with my family, so we stay out of the way. I'm going to convince the rest of the 51% socialist world that it wants government to take care of us, which seems like we're kind of losing the battle on health care and everything else. Right. Where, what can we really do to get government out of our lives on this, on this one thing? I mean, I think that uh, simply demonstrating by example is, is the best way. Um, it, one of the reasons that attracted me to writing the book, The Self-Pay Patient, is that I frankly got to ignore all of the political and ideological stuff. Uh, I mean, I spend time in that in, you know, my policy writings for other think tanks, but, uh, you know, the fact that this is something that people can do on their own was very attractive to me. But I think that then uh, just showing people that, you know, I'm uninsured and, you know, my kid got cancer but it's okay because we're a member of a ministry or because we had this, you know, alternative type of insurance policy. When people, uh, you know, frugality is, is a very uh, important motivator. And if and when people who have that, you know, government please take care of me mentality, when they start to see their friends, their neighbors, their, uh, their relatives who have opted out, who have gone self-pay and hearing that, you know, hey, you know, John's kid got cancer, but it wasn't a problem because of this. Well, you know, maybe that's worth looking at. I mean, there, there's 
a hardcore element that you know you're, you're just never going to convince Elizabeth Warren that you know a market for healthcare uh, is, is is a viable solution. But for a lot of people that are only sort of vaguely attached to that security blanket of government, I think a, a number of them can be um, persuaded over time, not necessarily by you know hearing a, hearing me speak or. or you know, hearing a politician give a, a great speech, but simply watching people around them do this, see it working, and uh, you know, thinking, well, maybe, maybe that is something for me. And maybe they're not going to immediately, you know, run out and join a ministry, but maybe they will say, you know, I can save money by going to a six thousand dollar deductible, and I'll do this whole self-pay stuff for, you know, the, the the small stuff, you know, just sort of wheel them in slowly until they get accustomed to the idea and. Right there. Um, for the old guys in the room. So you're so you're a Medicare patient. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a premium so that you get charged penalty for that you can opt out. So I assume this is not a substitute for Medicare. No. Medicare and, and self-pay patients, there, there are things where it works, sort of, you know, the, the self-pay patient stuff that I write about in the book generally is comprehensive and will cover pretty much anything and everything that anybody might need except for the Medicare population because it, it, it is a very different animal. That said, there are some options available to Medicare patients. One of the things, I didn't talk about it, are they're called direct primary care practices. These are primary care physicians that they've opted out of the uh, insurance system, opted out of Medicare in many cases, and for a fixed monthly fee usually anywhere from forty, fifty, sixty dollars a month, you have unlimited access to a primary care physician. And and there are direct primary care physicians practices who have a focus on Medicare patients. And uh, if you go that route, you know, Medicare is not going to reimburse you. They're not participating providers or anything like that. But if you're interested in having access to a physician uh, without having to go through all the Medicare bureaucracy, without having a Medicare bureaucrat saying, oh no, that's not really part of the formulary or whatever, then a direct primary care practice is something that, uh, that you might want to, to think about. You know, one of the things that I tell people is the purpose of saving money on health care as, as a self-pay patient is not to save money. It's to get the health care you need. And if you look at it through that paradigm, you know, you're probably not going to save a lot of money if you, if you, you know, sign up for a direct primary care practice. But you are going to get access to a primary care physician around the clock. You'll probably have, you know, his or her email, phone number, uh, text. Uh, you'll be able to get in same day appointments. Uh, you'll get access to the health care that, uh, you know, depending on, on your health status, may or may not be of value to me. I would never join a direct primary care practice at this point just because I see doctors, you know, once every four years. It would be a total waste of money for me. But for people who will see a doctor four, five, six, seven times in any given year, they're great deals, and including for the Medicare population. Um, right here. And if we go to some of these alternatives, they're not required to report our medical no. care records that's all private? That is one of the great things about the, the cash-only uh, market. HIPAA, which is basically sort of the umbrella through which your medical records can be sucked up into CMS databases and, and you know, lots of people have access uh, to it. Um, the, that's only for the insurance system. If insurance is involved in paying for your care, then HIPAA applies and they can scoop up potentially your medical records. If they're not a, a provider that participates in any insurance plans, HIPAA doesn't apply, and there's no obligation on their part to ever, you know, electronic health records is one of the things that uh, actually the stimulus uh, tried to force uh, electronic health records on a lot of doctors, and um, uh, that is a opportunity for, you know, lots of intrusive uh, meddling by the government, but if you're not participating in any of the insurance carriers, there's no electronic health record requirement, there's no HIPAA requirement, there's you know, it's not unregulated simply because, you know, if you're a doctor, you have a medical license and stuff like that. But it's about as unregulated as you're going to find in the healthcare market in America is going to one of these cash-only doctors. Yes? With Liberty Health Chair, um, oh, I just want to say yes. thank you for the voice and, and, 
helping create the awareness out there because this is so critical to, to giving people the education for what they need. And then just to answer the gentleman's question, yeah, he, everyone who does participate, they will receive something uh, at the end of the year just to make sure for tax purposes. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great way just to, to validate everything you've said. It, you're just, you're, you're a leader in this and our hat's off to you. So thank, thank you for all you're doing. Uh, back there. A website for mental health providers. That's oh, yeah, and and I've uh, talked about um, you know the book. Obviously, that's what I'm here to talk about. I have a website, theselfpaypatient.com, or just selfpaypatient.com. It's primarily a blog. I sort of do running commentary, news information about these types of topics. Um, and there is uh, what I call right now. Um, the self-pay healthcare market page. It's a horrifically ugly page. I've actually put it on upgraded my website to make it more user friendly. But there are a variety of links. There's probably close to 150 links there to a variety of tools, providers, and there's a section on, on mental health. One of the things that's actually interesting about the, the mental health field is that while in most aspects of medicine, uh, you know, you might be lucky if two, three, four percent of the, the provider community is accustomed to self-pay patients and can give you a price when you call up and say, I sprained my you know, wrist, how much is it going to be for an x-ray and, and 20 minutes with the doctor? They can tell you that. Only a small percentage of them can do that. Uh, in the mental health arena, however, probably close to half of the providers are in fact cash only. They don't participate in any insurance. Uh, they are accustomed to somebody calling up and saying, "How much is it going to be for this?" And they can they can tell. Them. And, and and that's really to me what distinguishes a cash only or more specifically a cash friendly um, uh, practice is if you call them up and say, "How much is fill in the blank going to be?" They can tell you in a minute or two. They're not going to be you know ask you, "Oh, well, what insurance policy do you have?" And I have to reprice this, and I can't tell you, which is how most healthcare providers operate. In the mental health uh, field, though, most of them are able to very easily do that, and they're accustomed to dealing with self-pay patients. Right here. So you mentioned this thing called Chargemaster. Oh, Chargemaster. Charge yes. Master, charge Master. Well, I know the ECH has something about how people not profiting at a certain point, giving a check back to patients. What? Um, and actually, uh, there's uh, kind of two different uh, things. Um, there is a provision in the Affordable Care Act for insurance companies to, if they uh, spend less than 80% of the, the insurance premiums on uh, actual care, then they have to rebate some portion of that back to the premium holders. But that's on the insurance side of things. There are, I tell people that there are exactly two things in the Affordable Care Act that I actually like. <laughs> um, and, they're, and they're very small things, and how they manage to make it in such a horrific bill, I have no idea. But one of them actually does address the charge masters, and basically what it says uh, is that individuals or hospitals who have these charge masters, they are limited in how much over their sort of average charge for you know a cancer patient or surgical procedure they're limited in how much they can charge that there will be audits and i'm sure those audits will be you know horrifically conducted by the irs or cms I, I, i'm you know i'm not necessarily pleased about that but i am pleased that there is something in this otherwise horrific bill that addresses something that is pretty important to self-pay patients because i mean i've heard so many stories of people who go to their hospital uh, and don't realize that uh, you know the anesthesiologist or the surgeon is out of network. The hospital is in network, but the surgeon who gets called in for the emergency surgery they're out of network. And so all of a sudden, instead of the you know four thousand dollar bill that they, that the surgeon might charge for an in network, you know now it's a twenty thousand dollar bill. Um, and and so I, I am happy about that one little element. The other thing about the Affordable Care Act that I, I think has some promise that of course the Obama administration has done nothing on is it requires that the FDA establish a process by which biological drugs can be approved for generics. Um, we're all familiar with generics and sort of the chemical world uh, and, and how much less expensive they are. 
the law has for a long time allowed it for uh, biologicals, which are a lot of the really expensive drugs, um, but the FDA never got around to establishing a process for biologicals to be approved. Uh, ACA mandates that they do, and of course the Obamacare, Obama administration is doing nothing on it. Um, so, yes, in the back. Since you are a member of a sharing ministry, have you looked into whether you qualify for an HSA? Uh, I do not. Uh, I, believe me, I, I looked into it, but the, uh, the HSA laws are very clear. It has to be connected to a high deductible health plan. Um, and the ministries are not considered health plans. There is legislation in Congress. The last time I checked, and you might be able to update me, but about 73 members of Congress had signed uh, onto a bill that would allow members of sharing ministries to open up HSAs. But otherwise, you know, the, I, there are a lot of people out there who have had HSAs, they have balances in them, and then when they, you know, drop their insurance co uh, coverage, they can leave, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry they, they can bring with them their funds, and they can use those as a member of the ministry. They can't put more money in, and people who don't already have one in, uh, set up can't start one. My, su my suggestion is that each of us, especially those who have gray hair, <laughs> that we should not be buying these book, this book, your book, for us, but for every 20 or 30 something that we know. I, those are the people who think they are invincible, and they're the ones who need this. Well, and, and not only do they see themselves, many of them, as invincible, and, and this is, uh, I actually wrote, uh, uh, I think, a blog post at thefederalist.com about this. Maybe it's actually for Hartland's blog, but it's about value. Telling a otherwise healthy 28-year-old, you need insurance because you might get cancer, they just don't see the value in that, especially when the price is, you know, $150, $200 a month, and they're, you know, they got their student loans, they've got a car loan, they're struggling already, and now you're trying to tell them, look, spend, you know, $200 a month to get something that there's a 99% chance you're not going to need. They don't see the value in it. And, and for me, with an economics background, value is really what it's about, not price. And the thing about being self-pay, because it is so much less expensive, the value paradigm shifts. Now you're not asking them to spend $200 a month for an insurance policy that they'll never need. You're asking them to spend maybe $15 a month or $30 a month for an insurance policy that they probably still won't need, but the value paradigm shifts. Uh, or, you know, most people, even the, the so-called young invincibles, they do kind of have a sense of, you know, maybe I should have something. Like I said, 20-year-old college roommate, testicular cancer. It happens, and most people in that young invincible category know somebody like that. And so uh, for them, I, I agree. And anybody who wants to buy a bunch of books, I do have book rates available. I'm happy to talk to them uh, at any time. One more. Uh, I'm going to go right back here, but I'll be around for a little bit afterwards and, and happy to answer some more questions one-on-one. -on -one. Yes? Well, thank you again for uh, coalescing some thoughts that most of us have had for a long time about how it's supposed to work. having a self-pay guy for 30 years. I have a non-qualified agent. It's a fabulous way to do this. You don't have to have a qualified. You just set aside money. Yeah. You just down the road. I mean, it's just a great thing to do. Yeah. Well, I'm buying all these books from my doctor. Huh. And I'm yeah. saying, listen, you know, I've been talking with my doctor for a long time about how this has got to work on self-pay, and she argues sometimes. <laughs> so I'm buying all these books for her. I think she needs to see this as well. Yeah. I, uh, I hear from a lot of doctors saying, you know, I'm thinking about this, but I've got four other people in my practice, and, uh, you know, send me four so I can pass it out so that they can uh, they can do it. Uh, all right, that's all that uh, I think Jim's going to allow me uh, for the moment. Like I said, I am going to be around for a little while. Thank you again for listening.